The Great Evil Dungeons, or to be exact, the Seven Great Evil Dungeons. Seven dungeons mankind agreed were unconquerable. Even among the notorious Seven Great Evil Dungeons, in the worst of all demonic realms, the Primordial Core. Dozens of creatures guarded the dungeon and the gatekeepers of the three crossroads waited. The homunculus guarding the red crossroad on the left is named René, and the skeleton guarding the blue crossroad in the center is named Pedrick. Not much information was known about the filth-tainted path to the right. And the ruler of this unconquerable fortress was the primordial monster from the first chapter of the Empire's mythology, the Devourer. Then we see a girl saying, that is what it says in here, as you said after the book spread among the humans there have definitely been more intrusions, we see a monster saying, you gotta have the know-how to manage a dungeon to you know, wrap it up in a bit of mysticism and the humans do not even notice. You have to leak some information like this, so they make the mistake of thinking, we know everything about that dungeon. So when they see books like these half filled with fantasy, they are all over them like moths to a flame. Even so, I honestly did not expect them to come flocking here, as we see the ground filled with corpses. Then we see the beast transforming into a human, patting the girl as she blushes. We see someone glaring in the background as we see a skeleton saying, Hey, are you sure we are here for a meeting? We are not just hanging out for fun are we, so why are the two of you the only one so happy? The vibes here are so sweet I think just breathing could give me cavities, but I do not think it will rot just my teeth, my head might rot too. Also, boss if you are going to polymorph, you might as well do it properly, right now I caught a glimpse of you patting her head, and you had six fingers, well it is still better than last time when he had over forty teeth and smiled broadly saying his transformation went great, it sent a chill down my spine. Then we see the girl saying, I will cut to the chase then, as you know humans have finally begun invading the right cross path. The problem is that in the process 116 black tentacles who were guarding the right crossroad suffered a major injury, his condition seemed pretty critical, and the boy says, well do not worry too much, the regenerative powers of the tentacles are beyond your imagination. Let us see what happens and if it really does not work out, get a new gatekeeper. The skeleton gets happy and says, Oh boss, then when you are hiring do me a favor and hire two of them, so I can quit too. And the boy replies, What are you talking about? Your contract lasts for life. Anyway, humans are only coming for my right crossroad. They might already be organizing a new raid force, humans these days actively use communication magic like telepathy, so the news about the crack in the rightward filth crossroad might already have spread. The boy slaps the table and says, well in that case, we will have to plan accordingly as well, you to listen carefully, we are going to switch positions, first you pointing at the girl, he says, you have been guarding the red cross path on the left, from today onwards you will take care of the filth crossroad on the right, the raid force will swarm and thinking it is empty, you should just gotta stop them. To the skeleton he says, you will take the red crossroad on the left, that she usually protects, humans who realize, she is on the filth crossroad will head for the red crossroad on the left, where she usually is, then you will be there to stop them. This way we can stop two invasions. And Skeleton says, wait boss, what do you plan to do, if humans head for the blue crossroad in the center? Everyone goes silent. The boy says, there is nothing we can do about it, they will have to enjoy a date with me. It is kind of a messy plan, then we see the girl saying, the most urgent matter is sort of taken care of. The only remaining item on the agenda is deciding what to do with that sword, I am talking about the one the leader of the raid force was using, as the skeleton finds the sword in the rubble, he says, that 36th masterpiece. It is a very famous weapon among humans, but it is not exactly a weapon, this sword is number 14, I guess I think its name is Tanabella. One of the blades this girl has right now is also one of the 36 masterpieces. As they think about what should they do with the sword, the skeleton says, if we give it to those at the entrance humans will snatch it back up from them, and if it falls into their hands again, it will be a headache for us too. Skeleton passes the sword to the boy, but the boy says, you wield swords too, can you not just use it? Skeleton gets so happy and says, I guess, I do not have a choice then, since it is your order boss. This is the primordial core home, to a terrifying homunculus maid Renee, who only has the devourer on her mind. A deaf knight executing deathly energy Pedrick, the only one with a conscience in the dungeon and master at messing with the boss. 
and a giant ancient monster, devourer, who is an embodiment of laziness. We see the boy telling the Pedrick, now that I have given you the sword, tear the resignation letter you have hidden in your ribs. Then we see Renee asking, what should we do about the remaining income distribution, and the boss says, let us do it, as we always have, use as much as we can on our end, and use the ones we can not have as bad to lure the next guys in. Renee replies, but we do not really have a use for the magic tools, should we remove the mana stones and sell them, we will gain quite a bit of money from them, hearing that he says, is that so, then maybe I will go and visit the human village. Shocking everyone. Pedrick says, it would be much better if Renee went, the boy gets a little angry and asks for a reason, and Padrick replies, you are bad at transforming into a human, as it was true, he agrees to it and says, fine then, buy lots of yummy things. Then we see Renee heading out for the village saying, the weather is quite nice today, I will be back Mr. Devourer. Then we see inside a jewel shop, as the owner looks at the gems, he says, hey kid, unfortunately, I just cannot buy these. Rene asked him why, and what is the reason. He pulls out a B-ranked mana stone and says, to buy one of these we commoners need to work hard for 10 years, but you see the ones you brought in are all bigger than this, these can only be used by the mages from the royal palace or the high-ranked ones from the mage tower, a jeweler from the capital who has an agreement with the royal family, or the mage tower's wing might be able to deal with it. As Rene hears that she thinks, the capital is too far, do I have to go to the mage tower, I do not want to go there, but if it is for boss, she picks up her jewels and starts to walk out, the owner yells, hey kid you left one, and Renee replies, that is a tip, thanks for the information human. Then we see Renee standing outside a huge building, Mage Tower's wing. She is greeted by some people at the entrance saying, you came to sell mana stones, if so, it would be better for you to meet with the guild master, and they guide Renee to his location, as she follows them, she thinks, so the structure is built in a way that the leader of the mage tower is located at the top of the tower, the human's mage tower is similar to that of a dungeon. Then we see the guild master saying, thank you for coming such a long way, I am Graumitz Ammer, the leader of Wing, this mage tower's guild, as Rene looks at the guild master thinking, this human, he possesses a fairly high amount of mana. As she introduces herself as Ren, guild master asks, I heard a young kid had come, so I was going to ignore you but according to the guard you had a bunch of mana stones. You must be well aware of the fame of our mage tower, I trust you brought high rank mana stones that match our standard. She pours out the jewel saying, you can confirm it yourself. Guild masters get surprised and thinks, these are all a rank mana stones and some of them are top grade, these are not items, that such a young child should own, this kid who is she. And says, you, where did you get these stones? As the guild master looks at Rene's appearance, he thinks that one of the empire's eight families hereditary possessed silver hair, did the daughter of that family run away and bring these in secret? There is no other way such a young child could have so many mana stones. So a noble lady, she must be ignorant of the world. And says, I was rude. I never even imagined the product would be this good. Here we want to buy all of these mana stones. What about 50 ounces of cold coins per stone, I will give you 80 ounces for the ones that are in particularly good condition. As Renee hears that she thinks about what the shop owner said about the earnings of common folks. And she says, human, if you joke around, you will die. Hearing that guild master thinks, damn it, it seems this lady is more aware than I thought, and says, to be honest, our guild does not have enough money to buy all of that, even if we gathered all our money. Renee replies with a scary look, then buys as much as you can. Then we see a chest full of gold coins, and the guild master says, 2,000 ounces of gold coins. This is all of the money we have. Under the condition of receiving all of the mana stones, what about we give you objects that are worth that much money? Renee tells him, are you sure the items are valuable, they need to be easy to sell. He replies, you do not need to worry about that, just come this way, I will show you the objects right now. As they start walking, the guild master says, Normally, we do not bring outsiders into this place, but we will consider you an exception, as the reach the mage tower storage. He starts showing her some items saying, This is the tiara made of four carat diamonds, in the center, there are small mana stones, so it is quite useful for mages. This is a living black pearl, it cries out if there is poison near the wearer. This pearl was made using alchemy. 
As he realizes that Rene does not like these items, he pulls out an item called Scarlet Love Stone, it is a gem that can help you fulfill your love. As she hears that her mind goes blank, and the only thing she can think about is, a gem, that can help you fulfill your love, her eyes start glowing with hope. Guildmaster continues, if you infuse mana into this gem, in front of the person you like, the spirit inside the gem will help you fulfill eternal love, no matter who it is. He asks if she likes it, and she replies, I want this one. Guildmaster says, I do not know about the others, but this gem will be a little difficult. You can even steal the heart of the emperor, so it is very expensive. Rene pulls out something, making the guild master sweat, it is her sword, and she says, with all of the money you gave me earlier, and this sword, give me that gem. We see, one of the mages asking the guild master, how can he give that gem away, he already knows what kind of object it is, if you send her away like that she will die, and the guild master replies, so what, it is an item that a foolish noble lady wanted and exchanged personally, do not worry, there will be no problem, the moment it is released, she will die, the person that annoying girl likes will also die, so there would not be any evidence left, I do not know who the other person is, but I, sure feel bad for them. Then we see a castle. This is one of the seven great evil dungeons, Chite Castle, we see Renee getting a haircut, and she says, I am sorry for suddenly showing up, I always owe you one each time I come, and the red-haired woman says, enough, it is natural for neighbors to help each other out, and seeing how cute you are makes me happy. This is the boss of this evil dungeon Elizabeth Batery, as she keeps grooming Renee she says, at times like this, I get jealous that you are a homunculus, to think this pretty face would not age, you look super young too, your skin is also paler than mine, you do not even know how much blood I use every day just for beauty treatment, and Renee stands up asking, what do you think of me right now, and Elizabeth replies, of course the most beautiful among all the women I have seen recently, I will assure you, no one would reject you right now. And then she asks, Renee who did you want to look good for, are you perhaps thinking of confessing to someone? Renee gets excited as she holds the gem in her hands, and says, yes, I am going to confess. Elizabeth gets shocked saying, really, I said that as a joke, to whom are you confessing to? And Renee replies, to Mr. Devourer. Hearing that Elizabeth says, you are saying an extreme joke like it is nothing, is it because you are a homunculus? And Renee replies, it is not a joke, I am going to confess to him. Elizabeth says, what do you like about him, is he not a bastard whose strengths are hard to even point out, and Renee replies, he has lots of strength and he is reliable. Elizabeth says, but he is so lazy, it counteracts that reliability. To which Renee replies, yes, he is lazy and quite big. He eats like a pig, sleeping every day and whenever he wants, he has no wits and has quite the appetite these days. Hearing that Elizabeth says, you know all of that, but you still like that bastard. Renee replies, yes I really like him. Elizabeth wishes her good luck, and tells her, if he rejects you come to me we see inside the dungeon raid union headquarters. We see a man reporting to the leader, so we assume warrior Vern's raid force has been annihilated. As we see many people sitting around a table, one of the men stands up yelling, there is no way, did they not say they easily got through to the gatekeeper, no corpses have been found. So how can you be sure they have been annihilated, there is no way Sir Vern would have died to a monster, as everyone starts bickering with each other. The man who came to report says, you are all wrong the primordial core is not that difficult or a big dungeon. The day you go and they will all kill or get killed but it has already been two days since we have heard from them in the dungeon. Vern is probably dead, we need to presume he is. Leader asks, if so, what happened to that family sword? The agent replies as communication magic got cut off after they entered the heart of the primordial core without re-entering that area, it will be impossible to retrieve the 14th masterpiece, Tanabella. As they all start to think about if they should enter or not enter the dungeon again. Leader thinks to himself, we have already lost one of the 36 masterpieces, and a warrior that the royal family cherished, if you fail the second raid as well, we will truly get killed. If you just leave things be the furious royal family will point their blades towards us, but what if Vern was not able to leave a severe injury to the ancient monster, what if the dungeon did not suffer for much damage from the raid force, what if even if we challenge it several times, and he says, it is impossible to attack the primordial core and the room gets quiet. 
We see someone entering the area saying, how intriguing, I wonder why you think that, I think it is definitely possible. Leader asks, why is the Royal Magic Academic Society here? And the guy who just entered says, do you not know whose orders our organization heeds? This is the third eye of the Royal Magic Academic Society. And he says, the fact that we are here means that you will need to pay for the price of your sins, as he gets angry and says, how foolish not only did you play a part in killing a precious warrior, but you have also thrown away the masterpiece that the emperor truly treasures into the enemy nest, even so, if everyone here dies who would handle the empire's countless raid forces. So we made an offer with his majesty, a solution to save you all, we will raid the primordial core again, leader asks, but how can we succeed in a place that even Sir Vern could not, the third eye says, Nifrim, we will send Nifrim. Leader says, wait, by Nifrim are you talking about the product with a lot of issues? And the third replies, Nifrim is not a failure but an undeniable success. And he asks, why do you think Sir Vern and his raid force did not make it out of the primordial core alive, because they were weak or because they were sloppy, no definitely not, Sir Vern and his raid force were clearly missing a certain factor. Just one, something even Sir Vern could not have, Nifrim has that. We will definitely succeed in this raid. We see Mr. Devourer sneezing in his castle and saying, I sent something ominous as if a huge disaster will befall us that kind of feeling, or am I getting a cold, as he sneezes so hard that his transformation wears out. We see the Devourer lying on the ground and thinking, I do not want to do this, but in this situation, I do not know when the humans will invade again. If I put off the petrol any longer, Pedrick will scold me. For a bag of bones, he sure is scary. He stands up saying, I do not want to be bothered anymore, the humans this time came from the area near Filth Road, should I head over there? He enters the room and sees defeated sixteen black tentacles, and thinks, I feel sorry for it, but there is not much I can do right now. Other than just wait. Then he goes to the next room and sees the defeated manager, Antropopago, and thinks, according to my memories, as long as it has a main body and nutrients it will regenerate by itself, and as he finds that body is still alive, it will recover on its own without any need for my intervention. And he says, the problem is the first four rooms that were destroyed, this is something I need to discuss with Pedrick, I have a feeling that I will be scolded again. As he yawns thinking, should I take a rest, I might have only checked filth road and room 5, but I did pretty good. Pedrick will probably understand, as he starts to walk away someone suddenly attacks him from behind, scaring him. We see someone coming from the cave saying, dirty human filth, as long as you have stepped foot in this place, do not even think about leaving. It was Renee and she said, I am sorry, I thought another puny human had invaded, Devourer said, well it is fine, I only jumped a little, putting that aside, Renee you dressed up. And Renee replies, you noticed, I am happy. He starts to panic and says, there must be something special happening. Thinking to himself, she took off the maid outfit, is she trying to quit before Pedrick? And Renee says, Mr. Devourer, can you give Renee some of your time and he agrees to it, at this moment only thought on his mind is, anything but a letter of resignation. Renee invites him to her secret place and tells him to sit, as she starts preparing tea. As the Devourer is walking towards the spot, he is still panicking thinking about the letter of resignation. Renee pours him a cup of tea saying, originally it was a place only I knew, but now Mr. Devourer knows as well. Also, it has already been 80 years since Mr. Devourer took Renee in, do you remember? He says, of course. As he remembers, 80 years ago dungeon clearing gained popularity. Over 1000 dungeons fell and the number of humans who reached the primordial core also surpassed 1000, it was during this time that Renee's status soared, earning her a nickname. And he says, yeah you suffered a lot, is your right eye feeling better, and he thinks to himself, thank god it was not a letter of resignation. And Renee says, I was glad, I could keep you safe. And he says, no, wait, what do you mean, was glad, are these not parting words? As Renee calls his name and tells him, I like you, I like you Mr. Devourer, for 80 years Renee has waited for this moment. And he replies, thanks for confessing to me, but our lives are always hanging by a thread, we never know when we will get hurt or die, it is not like we want either of us to live the reminder of our life in solitude right, Ren says, as expected it turned out like this, I knew it was a burdensome request, but I could not keep it inside any longer, but the thought of you rejecting Renee and walking away, 
that is too scary. She brings out the gem and says, Renee has always wanted to be loved by Mr. Devourer, no matter the cost, she kicks away the table, gets close to him saying, even if it means resorting to despicable measures, with this my wish is fulfilled, and as she puts the magic power inside the gem, Mr. Devourer starts turning into his beast from and says, Renee, you, just now, what you did to me, were you trying to kill me, looking at the scene, she gets scared and drops the gem, breaking it and says, what is going on? We see something coming out from the inside of the broken gem. We see Pedrick saying, Wow boss, you are the best, you did not stop at just driving the humans away, you even chased Renee away. I am so shocked, I cannot even shut my mouth. Your kicks really do not discriminate between friend and foe. Boss asks him, how can he fix something like this, and Pedrick replies, well, it is not entirely your fault. Of course, what you did to me was definitely your fault. Boss makes a funny face saying, I cannot quite recall anything. And Pedrick says, should I help you remember, we see Boss about to attack Renee. Pedrick rushes from behind telling the boss to calm down, but the boss is in too much rage that he cannot hear anything. Renee was so helpless, thinking of what she had done. Pedrick tries telling her to get away and leave this to him. But she was not in a state where words could get to her. Pedrick thinks she will just get in the way right now, so he strikes her with his sword pushing her away and is able to create a distance between her and the boss. But as the boss is in total berserk mode, he says, You, are you here to kill me too? Patrick asks the boss, You still do not remember anything, boss is embarrassed and apologizes. And says, I should go find Renee. And Pedrick says, yes, you should, do you not know how important Miss Renee is to our dungeon, from sourcing your food and managing the diet of other monsters to cleaning and repairing the dungeon, healing the monsters, and setting up traps. She also provides counseling and resolves every room's complaints, and converts the treasures, distributes income, and takes care of the ledger. Miss Renee practically runs this dungeon single-headedly, her absence would be more crippling to the dungeon, than you boss. It is better to find her before it is too late, whether it means bowing, begging, groveling, or even kissing her feet. Just bring her back, Pedrick gives the boss a bracelet saying, this is Demura, it is a bracelet that helps with mana stabilization. You do not need to know anything else, just know that it is expensive. Your body suffers from strong mana backflow, so its effectiveness is uncertain. Even if the effect is minimal, it should at least prevent you from seizing up while polymorph. Hearing that boss says, you being so prepared, it is kinda creepy like you knew it was about to happen. Pedrick says, I have a request, please do not misuse it, it is not very sturdy. Boss wears the bracelet saying, I will figure it out, as I use it. Then I will leave this place to you while I am gone, and Pedrick says, you need to return in five days, the humans will arrive soon. The boss replies, so I just have to come back before the raid force bastards arrive right? Patrick says if I cannot fend off the invaders in your absence, who knows what will happen if they reach that place. Boss gets ready to go out saying, I will bring back Renee in five days. And Patrick says, and if you pass by the human village, do not draw attention, revealing that a dungeon monster is in a human village will bring no good. With a sinister smile, Boss replies, if it goes south, I will just destroy everything in return. We see Pedrick saying, that things are more complicated than expected, as he brings out a paper from his armor saying, Renee went somewhere and traded that love gem for a mana stone with a demon inside, eventually the boss lost his mind and nearly killed her. Here is the prediction if the boss finds out about this, he will go crazy and he might destroy everyone, but it is not yet time for humanity to fall. As he notices something on the paper, the dungeon raid is about to happen in three days, realizing that he just told the boss to be back within five days, he starts freaking out. We see the boss laying on the ground thinking, this is already the second time I have been teleported to a bizarre place, as he remembers Pedrick saying, mana in your body moves chaotically, so you just do not use magic. The boss thinks, is it because of magic, let me give it another shot, as he tries to use teleportation magic, thinking about the coordinates of the place where Renee went to sell the mana stone, Haston village. And he teleports. Then we see a female demon saying, a mere human like you has risen all the way up here, I will do your monsters a favor and bestow upon them an honorable death, as someone replies what a joke, 
a lowly demon like you acting all triumphant, this is elite raid force ranked 32 in the empire, we will drag you down from the throne you do not deserve, and make a name for ourselves on this continent. Demon gets angry and stands up from her throne saying, I am the 17th successor of the demon king Asmodeus, Lymphagria. As she charges forward to attack saying, consider it an honor to know my name and meet your death. Demon and party leader start fighting, his party attacks with arrows but she easily deflects them. As one of the mages starts using his magic, Demon unleashes her energy waves making the human party members fall. He tries to block the attack by using the floor in front of him, making it like a wall, but he notices some ice shards around him, realizing, she is already ready with a new magic spell. He throws the broken tile to attack the demon and rushes forward. Demon attacks him with the ice shard saying, are you asking for your death what a fool? He blocks it with defensive shields, looking at that the demon thinks, I am sure I got rid of the mage. She notices that the mage is still supporting him from behind and tries to attack those mages but the party leader jumps in the way as their attack collides. Something falls from above and they both are pushed backward. As they both notice that something just appeared. The human raid force tried to get back up, but the party leader said, by the way, who the hell is that? I did not hear about any other raid force being here, as they all are still guessing what is inside the dust cloud. The demon thinks, is there another raid force, if their forces are strong enough to break into the demon king's fortress, the situation is not good. Who the hell is it, we see this is our boss saying, you people, do you know where Haston village is? We see everyone surprised, and they shout at him, you are saying that bullshit after appearing suddenly. Humans tell him to get away from the demon king. As the boss takes a look at the demon girl, he thinks, she is so different from the olden demon kinds, is it because of the generation gap? As the support forces arrive at the scene, they all start charging towards the demon girl. Making the boss think, this is so tiring, I need to find Renee. I do not think the conversation will work. If this takes any longer, I will be scolded by Pedrick, just thinking about that is annoying. Some humans start telling the boss to move quickly annoying him, so he turns around revealing his true form, instilling fear in the humans witnessing. And he starts killing humans one by one eventually wiping the whole room clean. Demon girl is shocked at what she just saw. And tells boss, that he might be stronger than her. She says I am very interested in you, I want to know you and starts asking too many questions, which creeps out the boss. To recover from the embarrassment, she tried to introduce herself like a superstar. For the boss it gets more creepy, but he has to find information. So he tries to play along and starts introducing himself, but he stops thinking, if I just reveal my identity, rumors will spread. Pedrick told me to be careful, there is no need to reveal my identity yet. So he makes a fake name, Devd Rowney. Lymph replies, can I address you comfortably as Sir Devd? She thanked him for helping her, as she might have been defeated if it was not for our boss. Since she was indebted to the boss, she offered to help him. Boss asks her about the route to get to Haston. Boss gets excited thinking, he might finally get some information as a gift of keeping her alive. But Lymph replies, what is Haston? Boss realizes that, it is not that she does not know the way, she has never even heard of Haston at all, have I come so far, that she does not even know where Haston is. So he asks her about the closest human village. Lymph replies, from what she knows, Riaz is the closest city here. Hearing that boss thinks, the empire's capital Riaz, that place takes two months by human carriage from Haston. He is freaking out for how far from the place he needs to be he is right now. Hearing that Lymph says, so you want to go somewhere far, then you could use the teleportation hub. It is a human invention made using magic and alchemy. It can forcefully initiate spatial transfer magic. Boss asks her, where can he find it? And she replies the teleportation hub is in Riaz. As they reach Riaz, Boss confirms if it is the right place. And thinks, there is a small chance to find Renee here, but there is no guarantee she went to Haston, I should gather more information. Lymph asks, you said you were looking for a girl with silver hair, I will help you find her. Boss asks, you are the owner of Demon Lord's castle, are you sure about leaving it alone? Lymph replies, there is no need to worry, I am a demon queen, a supreme body born to rule. The demonic castle is not important. The place where I stand is the territory of the demons and those who stand next to me are my army. Boss asks, is it like the authority of a demon queen, 
being able to call upon demons if you want it and she replies, that is right, not that I have tried that before. But since it is work that my father has done in the past, I will be able to do it as well. Since the castle my father passed down to me is half collapsed, there is not much I can do. Let us stop the depressing talks here and gather some information. As they start walking boss thinks, this somehow feels like it has gotten more troublesome. We see them getting beers, boss says, we still have a long way to go why are we here? Limf replies, you must not know much about human villages. The bar is where all the information is gathered. Look around and open your ears, the many conversations you hear, those are unrefined gems of raw information. You just have to pick and choose what you need to hear. As he starts looking around his eyes fall onto a board where people are gathered. Limp says, this is the collection of information I mentioned. Boss picks up a flyer saying, that is the list of the members in the raid force, I heard it was used to stop confusion of multiple raid forces going into the same dungeon at once. And Lymph says this is because there would be issues with the rewards. If they all come together chance of success would multiply, but they rush into the fire pit blinded by greed. Boss says, well, it is a good thing for us. Hearing that Lymph gets suspicious and says, it is strange, I am a demon queen so it is understandable but, you are just a demon of a dungeon, how are you able to travel outside freely? Boss replies it is a bit complicated to explain, can you just ignore it? Boss finds a list of the raid force for my house. As Lymph gets a look at that list, she says, it is a raid force list for the primordial core, it is the pinnacle of dungeons that even foolish humans recognize, and the goal of all demons, the being who rules over this dungeon is the lord of all things, God's guardian who punishes those who tremble in fear, an ancient monster standing at the top of everything, Mr. Devourer. Hearing that boss thinks, is it not closer to a homeowner than a ruler, one that is harassed by bad tenants? Lymph says, I like primordial core the most, I want to get stronger, so that I can have an audience with Mr. Devourer one day, not realizing that he is right in front of her. I really want to be like him, my father was strong too, unlike me, he was king befitting the throne, it is just that there was a human much stronger than him. Vern or whatever, that young hero. It is the same hero boss swallowed while yawning. Lymph says, I do not want to spend my life running the dungeon like my father, I just want to become strong so that the demons are attracted to my strength. Hearing that reminds boss of his past, I was once like that, with overflowing enthusiasm I led a powerful army that could take over half the world, it was a time when I tried to learn all the knowledge of the world. Mixing in with the humans that I thought so lowly of, swept away my emotions, giving all I had for them. But when it came to an end, I found out that it was all pointless. That is why I made lazing around my life's goal. We see Lymph blacked out from all the alcohol. So he grabs her on the shoulder and takes her away. As they leave a request for raid force has been listed there saying, raid time is scheduled within 72 hours from now. As Lymph wakes up in a bed, she does not remember what happened yesterday. Boss suddenly gets shocked and falls to the ground, as he sees Lymph has turned into a small girl, as he asks why are you so tiny, she starts punching Boss, and tells him that she has two forms, the older one was my second version, that humans do not look down upon, and this is my first form, transformation magic usually projects the user's future form, so when I become older, I will transform into that amazing, second version. She starts throwing tantrums getting angry at everything like a kid. This is Count of Hastings residence. We see some people shouting outside we came all the way from Riaz to raid the primordial core, open the gates and welcome us. Inside the castle, we see someone asking who sent this notice and learn it was sent under Third Eye's name. This is the Lord of Haston, Count Atark. He gets pissed and thinks, how can they do this without my permission? But this is the royal family's order and he cannot dismiss it. But he is skeptical if this raid be successful in subjugating the primordial core. They are too weak to target the primordial core, I have never even heard of their leader, Nifrim. If they mess things up, my region will have to face the consequences. He thinks what if I send a stronger raid force there first? He thinks the Mage Tower's wing might be able to do it. They recently made great progress through high-quality goods of unknown origins. If the rumors are true this issue can solved easily. The gatekeeper of the primordial core was defeated, we only have to take care of the devourer, who personally fought against, Warrior Vern. He asks to send in the request, with his name on the line, 
He offers a large sum of money and great honor. Someone breaks into the room asking, Are you Count Atark? I am Nifram, you are not opening the door, I apologize for entering like this. Counts asks for his reason to come here without notice, Nifram replies, You must have been notified by the royal family, and with an intimidating look he says, Is there a reason we should not have come here? One of the girl from the group says, What's with that look, smile for me, and give me some sweats, tea, and chocolates. Count tells Secretory to go get some. Nifram says, We are here for the Primordial core raid. Counts replies it has been just a day since the letter arrived, you sure are quick to act, when are you going for the raid? Nifram replied we were going to leave immediately, but something came up, so we will probably go tomorrow. Count says, is it not a little too soon, you should recover your strength, I will provide lodging and hospitality. Nifram replies, no we do not need that, we will stop by the mage tower and leave right away. Count asks for the reason of going to the mage tower. Nifram says, it is not for an urgent reason, we are just going there, to kill them all, as he smiles wickedly. The security in your house is way too poor, it was way too easy to eavesdrop using magic, you were going to ask Mage Tower for help right, we came all the way here for the raid, we cannot just give it up like that, we got to get rid of anyone or anything that gets in our way. It is a win-win for you, whoever is stronger between us and them will take on the primordial core. Count says, pardon my slip of tongue, I will not hire anyone else, so advance on your raid anytime you want. And Nifram agrees to that saying, I am overwhelmed by your grace, Count. We see Pedrick practicing with the new sword he got, and says, it is almost time for their arrival. We see the boss and little lymph walking around the city, he asks a guard, where can he find the teleportation hub, the guard replies, you have still got a long way to go. This area is just the entrance, hub is outside the imperial palace in a castle, you will have to cross three more castle walls. If you take a walk it will take at least a week. He gets horrified thinking, that is too long, forget about finding Rene, at this rate, Pedrick will run away from home too. Limp suggests, what if we use flying magic? But if they keep letting out mana, they will get found out by humans. We see someone approaching them saying, you two look in some trouble, I am sorry for unintentionally eavesdropping but by any chance are you guys looking to go to the hub? I am the flying coachman, Belver. As he points to his carriage with a strange creature, which is a fourth generation abandoned homunculus. It is a result of an artificial angel manufacturing plan. It is strong, follows orders, and can fly. It was abandoned because it could not bring out its original purpose. Lymph asks, is the human's homunculus experimentation over? Belver replies, there is no way the Empire would give up this kind of power. There are still stories about homunculi being mass-produced somewhere. Boss asks, are they not usually incubated in giant flasks? Belver replies, that is for first-generation incubation done 150 years ago. Hearing that Boss thinks, has it already been that long since Rene was born? Lymph asks, it looks durable enough, how long will it take to reach the hub? Belver replies flight will take 3 hours and 1 hour for inspection at each castle wall. For the two of you, I will only charge 8 ounces of gold. Boss is astonished, thinking that 800 ounces of silver is 100 times more expensive than yesterday's tavern fees. Lymph and the boss discuss about not having that much money. As Boss looks through his clothes, he finds a letter and some gold coins by Pedrick saying, Our clumsy boss, one day you will be thankful to me for this and they start their journey. As they are flying, Lymph asks, you are a monster from a dungeon, how are you able to go around so freely? Boss replies, saying I got kicked out a suitable response, she asks if the person we are looking for also got kicked out and Boss agrees. She feels jealous saying, that even after leaving the dungeon, you still care about your associates to the end. I want a colleague like that as well. I want to live a life like you. A life where we can take care of each other like this. After flying for a while, they reached the Street of Gold and Pleasure Survey rows. But they met with disappointment learning that, the hub has been shut down for the security of today's auction, after that VIPs will use the hub, so higher-ups will allow it, so come around 8pm. Boss asks, why are you closing the hub for one auction? Guard replies, yes, because a quite rare item was exhibited this time, showing him a paper, it is beheading Fong which had unknown whereabouts and suddenly was put on display. Looking at that boss thinks, I have seen this somewhere before. 
This is the same weapon that Rene uses. But Boss is surprised to hear, he might be mistaken since only one of these weapons exists in the world. He is shocked thinking, this is definitely Rene's weapon, why is it in the hands of humans, it cannot be Rene got captured by humans, no that is impossible, even the bosses of seven evil dungeons cannot mess with her easily. She is not called Blade Maid for nothing. He tries to remember if she was holding a blade when she left. But she was wearing a dress that did not have any pockets, and she threw daggers at me when she mistook me as an enemy, she never fights with less than five weapons, if you take away the blades from the blade maid what will be left of her. He starts to revert to his original form with anger and his aura starts leaking out as he asks, did Rene got killed by mere humans? As the boss gets angrier, he says, if Rene was killed by humans it is only right for me to kill every bastard here. Lymph holds his hand trying to calm him down, he asks her, that weapon, there is only one in the whole world correct, according to her knowledge it was the truth. She replies, why ask this all of a sudden, and he tells her that the friend he has been looking for, it belongs to her, I have to find it. You do not have to help me anymore and thanks her for the help she did in this short time. Warning her that she should get out of this place as soon as possible. Lymph asks if the friend he has been looking for, the demon that takes form of a silver-haired woman, a warrior who wields the beheading fawn, the blade maid, Lady Renee. With an awkward laugh she says, that vicious voice of yours cannot scare me, as I have already figured out your identity. If you claim Lady Renee is your friend, then you must be the master of the primordial core, Lord Devourer. His underling, I am sure of it. I know what you are thinking right now, so I shall help you and you will not object. He asks, for Demon King, are you okay with such simple reasoning? She tells him, it is not logical who becomes king, but the demon king who dictates logic. As boss calms down a bit, she says, that face, that is the Sir Dev. I know that I am glad you are back to yourself, I shall assist you from now on, so worry not. And promise her to never use that voice to say such things. Outside the auction house. We see Lymph in her older form asking the guard if they can join the auction. Guard asks them to identify themselves first. She introduces herself as Mel's of House Agria, and my attendant Devd. As the guard checks for their names unable to find it on the list, she tells Dev to show the invitation, guards tells them that there were no invitations sent. Boss punches him in the face saying, here is your invitation to the afterlife. Boss asks Lymph why did she wore something like this, and she tells him, are you afraid of being charmed by my fabulous self, he tells her you are just a kid so dress like one. They start moving as Lymph starts throwing tantrums. Inside the Chait Castle. We see Renee. As she mumbles, Renee can no longer return to the primordial core as she cries. Eighty years ago, Graffinia Forest was set ablaze. We see Boss consoling the Witch of the Forest. Telling her he returned the favor to those humans, and the forest will recover in no time. As he knows that this forest has been a fortress for the primordial core, so he needs to make a good impression on her. All the humans who started the fire are dead, her anger will gradually subside. There was another matter he needed to think about, as he got intrigued by looking at a weak and caged female homunculus. He thinks about killing her too as to not leave any witnesses, but then he tells her the final words of her master saying that she is free and can leave if she wants to. He tells her as he breaks open the prison bars, I am not saying I will help you, it is your choice if you want to die trapped here or outside, it is up to you Lelo. He says that her master was looking for something here, it must be you. My mercy born of curiosity ends here and he disappears. Lilo was a title addressed to the most talented maid, this was the first time someone called her by that as she sheds tears of joy and freedom. Outside the demon castle, we see Renee sitting on a cliff, as Elizabeth tells her about the raid force sent to Primordial Core, Renee is still sad and would deny to go back, so Elizabeth tells her, I value your happiness but, you should make sure to settle all your problems, those two will look for you everywhere, if they find out you were tricked by humans, what do you think those two will destroy everything? If you are going to live in the shadows, erase all your tracks. Because of the raid force, the primordial core will be busy, this is the best time to do so. Renee tells her, I will be going far away for some fresh air. Elizabeth is worried as she notices that Renee's right eye was getting blurry. Renee tells her not to worry and asks for her blades. In the capital, we see the boss trying to get the location of the beheading fawn, the helpless guard tells him it was submitted by the magic tower of Haston. 
Boss thanks him for the information and lets him live. As they were leaving, the guard thought, I almost died, I am just a guard, what did I do wrong? Boss subtly appears from behind saying, that is right, you have done nothing wrong. You just happened to catch my attention, unfortunately, as he reveals his true form, saying, what do you guys call it when you enter our territory? You use fancy words like raid, not massacre or slaughter right? Have you ever felt sorry for the monsters you kill? Did they do anything wrong at all? It is the same for me, as he devours him? Inside the auction hall, the price for beheading Fawn keeps on rising. There were two strong people for the security, Hero, Wu in Historia, and Hero, Tracker Garrett. As the big caller was about to give the final call to end this auction, we see Boss grabbing him and saying, I will be the one ending this auction and all of you who are gathered here to buy this weapon, instilling fear and despair onto everyone present. We see Historia rushing into battle mode but Garrett stops her as she realizes that the thing in front of her is far too dangerous. Boss can feel traces of Rene emanating from the weapon, he is now sure that Rene was tricked by humans, he tells everyone that the details are too complicated, so I will just return this to its original owner. People start yelling at the guards to do something about the situation, hearing that boss tell them, looks like you have no intention of sending me off nicely, I feel the same way, I am going to rip you all to pieces and bury you with this blade. Historia jumps in yelling, I will not allow that. Looking at her boss thinks even with such speed and battle gear, you got no talent for it. I will grab those hands of yours and smash those goblets, Historia throws a punch, and boss blocks it with his bare hands, but he gets thrown back to the wall with the impact. Historia thinks she did it. As she hears the boss from the dust cloud, she thinks, he is still alive, that technique destroys most dungeon bosses in an instant. She cannot figure out who is this monster in front of her. Boss goes into devourer mode to swallow her, we see Garrett coming from the back as Historia tells her not to come closer. We see Lymph asking the boss if he is alright, she thought he died a helpless death. Boss thinks, that attack, was not something a human is capable of delivering, if something like that had hit my heart, it could have undone my polymorph. Pedrick would have scolded me like hell for that. As Boss thinks about the fight, while he is distracted by Historia, Garrett casts several layers of protection and escapes at the same time, making him smart piquing his interest in humans more. Somewhere in the streets, we see Historia has fallen into the ground. It was making her feel ashamed after being defeated by just one attack from a monster. She looks around for Garrett. She comes in saying, how can I hear you if speak so softly, making her relieved to see that she is alive too. Garrett starts pulling Historia's cheek saying, if I was not there, we would be preparing for your funeral right now. Historia notices that Garrett has lost her left arm during that fight, and she starts crying and feeling sorry. Garrett yells at her saying, get a hold of yourself, you are a hero. If it is just one arm, then it's nothing, do you even know what you are up against? The monster of the primordial core, the devourer. Historia thinks of it as a joke saying, why would a monster like that come here? Garrett tells her that she does not know the reason but she is certain it was him. On that monster's foot were traces hero Vern, that looked less than a month old. This is more serious than we thought, if this continues, this empire might fall. Historia yells, we should make more efforts to stop him, this is human territory after all. Garrett tells her this is not something that we can figure out with strength alone, we need demon subjugation squad's assistance and report to the imperial family, I will move by myself first. In my current condition, I cannot teleport both of us. She starts healing Historia telling her to stay here and wait here for her. Garrett uses her magic to teleport. Inside the destroyed auction building. We see the boss thinking if he should chase those who escaped or just go straight to Haston. Since he has recovered beheading Fang, there is another goal he must not forget, that is to at least find Renee's body. As boss tells Lymph to prepare for the goal, she looks distressed about something, when asked she tells him, I knew you were strong, but the more I learn, the stronger you seem to be than I expected, she asks him, who is stronger between Lady Renee and you. Boss taps her on the head saying, why be depressed over something like this, I am just Sir Devd. Once everything is taken care of, I will tell you the truth. Now let us show them a demon king's power. She transforms into her adult form, and uses magic called Reconstruct. Destroying the whole area in an instant. Historia looks at the scene from the streets thinking, 
That is the direction of the auction house, doing such a thing in the middle of the capital, those bastards. She is hesitant about what to do as she thinks about what Garrett told her before leaving. Suddenly a child grabs her hand asking her to save her father. Her doubts fade away as she starts walking towards the direction of the explosion telling everyone to not worry anymore as I am the hero Wu in Historia, I will never avoid a monster like that. Boss comes out from the wreckage, asking her what the hell she did just now, Lymph explains, reconstruction, it is high-ranking magic that causes ground to collapse, everything is all tidy now. Boss says, were there no other magic she could have used? She replies, do not blame me for this, you started posing and said let us finish things, so I used the coolest magic. If you were going to complain, you should have told me specifically what magic to use. Situation is now getting complicated now. Boss asks her if she remembers the way to teleportation hub, and asks her to go there and take care of it, since the humans will be flocking that way. And he leaves to make arrangements so he can go to Haston as soon as he arrives there to Lymph. She asks you have been talking about Haston for a while, where exactly is that place? Boss replies, you know where the primordial core is right? It is the closest town to there. They both leave to complete their current tasks. Boss comes across a group of people telling him they are Blue Crane subjugation team, they ask him to identify himself. Looking at that boss thinks, they are all busy getting into formation, why humans are like that, I heard a large group was gathered around the auction house, but it was just some soldiers from someone inside. Boss tells them, you want to know my identity, I am, your enemy as he starts revealing his devourer form. Inside the primordial core. We hear Sylvia saying, it is said whoever enters this cave never returns alive, as she keeps annoying Nifrim. Then she says, is it not strange, the first room we came across was full of corpses, but this room is too clean, as if, someone was cleaning. Nifrim asks his team what they think of this. As they start to discuss, there is no way subjugation team would have advanced cleaning up the place, what if it was cleaned by a monster with intelligence? Nifrim notices something and yells, do not play tricks, are you deceiving us, monster? From the darkest part of the cave we hear a voice saying, you are so loud, it makes my ribs echo. I did not clean it to deceive you, it was just unsightly to see it all lying around. I did it because I heard guests were coming to our home. Nifrim asks Sylvia to cast a light spell, illuminate. As the cave lights up, we see Pedrick sitting there saying, even though we did not call for you. Welcome to our home. Nifrim realizes this is the Death Knight Pedrick. He asks everyone to calm down, putting away their weapons and staffs. Nifrim tries in sudden attack, as Pedrick blocks it saying, you do not have any manners, give me some time to breathe at least. He is hit by an ICE spell, but it has no effect as he says, one versus all is definitely too much for me, even though I will win of course. Nifrim and Pedrick start fighting toe to toe. Pedrick notices something as his sword falls out of his hand, saying, you are strong for a human, secret to your strength is buff magic, as he thinks, those buffs would not last long, I just need to last till that, but he is subtly gets stacked with different types of negative debuffs as he falls to the ground, Nifrim stands on top of him saying, who will beat who you said. Pedrick compliments him for using magic to drive him into a corner. Looking at that Sylvia thinks, is that it, primordial core is not all that much I guess. Pedrick looks at her thinking, should I have gotten rid of this mage first? Nifrim stomps him into ground, trying to stab him with all his strength. To his surprise, Pedrick blocks the sword holding it in his fingertips, starts laughing, and says, that was fun, I was really immersed in my acting this time. I have been bored for a long time, even if I was acting, I wanted to experience the feeling of crisis once. With a sinister gaze he says, thank you for playing along my rhythm everyone. We see Pedrick asking him, even if Fymore is a moron, he would not have sent just 30 people, and I am sorry to say this, but this raid force was subpar, so tell me what are you hiding, I am a very kind and generous skeleton, if you are willing to answer, raise your right hand, if not raise your left. Nifrim raises his right hand making Pedrick believe he will answer, but then, he changes his hand posture to a buzz off middle finger. Pedrick raises his sword telling him, I shall respect your decision, so please die slowly, and he stabs him in the chest. Pedrick starts walking away thinking, Nifrim is dead, but then, we see him opening his eyes looking at Sylvia, and saying, I am sorry, but, 
I have to live, and he starts eating her corpse. We see Pedrick hiding behind a rock thinking, I knew there was something more to this guy, does eating corpses make him stronger, and heal wounds, does it accumulate with each meal, is it limited to humans only, what could be the source of this ability, alchemy, or magic, since there are plenty of corpses, I should take my time testing it. Then, he starts to think about his boss, wondering how he must be doing, and hoping he is not doing anything strange in a weird place. We see the boss devouring someone, as Historia reaches that area, he asks her if she is here to die too, she says, no, I am Wu in Historia, the hero. He tells her that, I never asked who you are, I do like your spirit but you cannot defeat me. She knows that it is true, but, she has to stop him, as she launches a surprise attack on the boss, boss easily blocks it with his bare hands, pulls her closer, and says, I am sorry, but you will only get to land one attack on me. He tightly grabs her hands, and tells her to try to escape like last time, if she can. He starts throwing her around like a ball. As she is getting beaten, she realizes that this monster cannot be defeated, she can only buy some time like this. Boss holds her in the air by her hand thinking, if it is over, with a faint voice she says, I am a hero, I cannot go down like this, I cannot let you reach to my people. By using her other hand she throws a strong punch, but it has no effect on the boss. As she starts losing her energy to fight, he says, congratulations, you did not die in vain. I will remember your name, though, I am not sure for how long. Out of respect, I will give you a painless death. Suddenly, something hits him on the back, and as he turns around, he notices a group of people standing there, one of which quickly saves Historia. Boss says, are you guys sausages or what? You keep on coming like links of sausage. One of them comes forward saying, we took drastic measures to save Historia, please forgive our rude actions, and allow me to offer my greetings, however late they may be. I am, Arl Ethelbria's Lives 10, of Black Tiger Order. I am honored to meet the Almighty Lord Devourer. Boss asks him, how he knows his identity, Arl replies, I have a talented person under my command, who was able to recognize you. Then Boss tells him, right now, I am in a bad mood, and you are wasting my time, if you are planning to attack me after running your mouth, let us just get it over with, as he starts releasing his aura. Arl replies, you are mistaken, we would not dare to do that. We have no intention of fighting against you lord. We have simply come here to offer you a deal. That makes boss angry, as he says, a deal with me, you better read the situation carefully, if you dare to insult me, you will not die an easy death, as his aura envelopes the whole area. Arl knows it is a gamble, and tells him, the original owner of the beheading farm is still alive. I assume, you did not come all the way here just for a weapon. We come to offer you aid in fulfilling that which you desire. Boss replies, what will you do if I say, I do not have anything I want help with? What if, I came here just because I was bored, and I actually want to exterminate all humans, what will you do then, as he comes closer to him? Arl replies, if you were always going to destroy everything in the end, then it is still worth a try. Boss tells him, so you want to avoid destruction, then find out where the owner of this item is immediately. Arl agrees and asks Garrett to find her. Garrett tells them that to find out where someone is located, she needs to look at the traces they have left on objects. If it is okay, she would like to ask permission to inspect beheading Fong. Boss pulls out the weapon, telling her, if you do anything stupid this will not end with you losing just one arm. She starts analyzing it and says, they are too far away to determine their precise location, but the person is moving west, in the direction opposite of the Imperial Palace. Boss realizes that Rene is alive, and must be going to Haston Village. He starts to leave, as he tells them, he is in their debt and will remember them both. As Boss enters the auction area, we see Lymph standing on top of corpses, all bloodied up, saying, Look at this, I upheld my promise of defending the teleportation hut. With this, it is enough to say that favor has been sufficiently returned, as she collapses. Boss catches her as she turns back into Little Lymph and says yes you did well. Then, we see Boss trying to figure out the use of the teleportation hub, as he checks the coordinates, and infuses his mana, the mechanism collapses. 
Boss is confused, thinking, why could it not endure my mana? He was confident, since, his polymorph was quite stable. He thinks, if I use my bracelet's mana suppression function for transfer magic, I might be able to safely use teleport. I would have to undo my polymorph for that, but if I did that, that is practically announcing my existence to all the living things around me. And he says, fuck it, I have already screwed things up past the point of no return, it is too late to end things smoothly. He removes the bracelet. His polymorph starts fading away. His beast form emerges from the area shaking everything nearby. And he uses teleport magic to reach the magic tower in Haston village. Inside the magic tower, we see Rene, asking the guard, human, can you use transfer magic here? Guard replies, no, there are resistors that surround the entire area, so you cannot enter without going through verification process. Rene says, then, it looks like, you cannot escape, as she pulls out her blades, and kills him. As she starts going inside, she thinks, when I first got here, I had a thought, that these magic towers are similar to dungeons, these are basically dungeons made up of humans. They are just weak monsters, as she starts killing anyone or everyone she can see. And she starts climbing the stairs to the tower's top floor. We see the leader saying, I made preparations, wondering, which enemy I would be facing, but, are you not that noble miss who came earlier? I guess, you were not a human. Renee asks her for the weapon she left behind, Leader replies, that belongs to me now, I do not have any reason to tell you where it is. That aside, there is something I am curious about, you, how are you still alive? As Renee pulls out her blades, Tower Master says, you are carrying around a weapon, that does not match your cute face, but do you think, you can face me with something like that, as she casts a defensive shield around her, looking at Renee breaking it in one shot, she thinks, this brat, just how strong is she, still, this tower is on top of a mana spring, if I use all that energy, I can definitely win. Renee charges forward asking about beheading Fawn, charging her skill, tower master tells. Her, it is no longer here, I have put it up for auction a while ago, since you look pretty strong I have to go all out from start, she makes a lightning spear, and charges it up with multiple buffs and tells Renee to try to pierce through this, a blast occurs, as the dust subsides, we see Renee stabbed with multiple magic spears, looking at her tower master thinks, this is an advanced skill, that not even most dungeon bosses can withstand, there is no way she can survive this. But to her surprise, both her hands are sent flying in the air, she starts whining and wondering how this happened. Renee comes closer, and says, all I did was cut your hands off, why make such a fuss, human? She starts begging for her life, as Renee stomps on her, but nobody can save her and she collapses. Renee thinks to herself, it is over, any trace of her has been erased, now, what is Renee supposed to do? What is left for Renee, as she starts getting tired but she cannot fall asleep or she might never wake up? We suddenly hear someone, leader, how did this happen, we see someone holding on to the tower master, he tells her to hold on, she says, it hurts, hurry and treat me, no, kill that bitch first. Hyam tells her to calm herself, as she has lost too much blood, he holds a crystal in his hand, but she is unable to see it clearly with all the blood on her face. Hyam tells her, it is a mana stone, that allows you to escape from here, I do not have enough mana to activate it, you have to imbue it with your mana. As Renee looks at it, she remembers that it is the same thing that was inside the love stone. Leader thanks him, but as soon as she fills it with her mana, dark energy comes pouring out from her body, Haynes tells her that, you have too many enemies, even in your own family, they gave the order to get rid of you, the moment you act suspicious. He turns around and thanks Renee for making his job easier. And says, at this rate, you might come after me, so this is a form of insurance, that will buy me time to escape, as Leader's body starts mutating, and it turns into an ugly monster. Looking at it, Renee thinks, she cannot see from her right eye anymore, that is not an opponent she can defeat with a battered body, and without a proper weapon. But it is alright, I will pay for my sins here, and will erase any traces of herself forever, but she gets angry, because, she does not want her body to leave the scent of her boss, 
in her last moments, and she charges toward the monster. As she was about to be killed she thinks, if boss finds out she died, will Lord Devourer be sad? The whole area gets covered in darkness, as we see someone, holding Renee in his hands, and asking if she is okay. She had this same feeling, when her body, and mind were sapped out of strength, when she could not find the meaning of life, the one who saved her before, was, Lord Devourer. Renee is confused to see Boss here, wondering, if it is a delusion. Boss tells her to wait, and turns to the monster. He is angry, how dare someone lay a hand on his Renee. He releases his aura, and starts attacking the beast, every time he deals any damage, that monster just heals up real fast. Boss gets annoyed, and starts smashing him everywhere. Monster tries to grab onto the boss, making him disgusted, so he stomps it into the ground, and realizes, that the source of this monster's power, is the magic tower's mana. And he says, if that's what it is, it is much easier. As he swallows the beast with magic tower altogether and says, you sure taste disgusting. He looks at Renee, and sits with her saying, there were a lot of things, I wanted to say when I got to meet you, but now that we are here, my mind has gone blank. If I knew this would happen, I would have written it down or something. Also, I met a green-haired human on my way here, I did kill him, that would not be a problem, right? Then he says, Renee, I am sorry, for what I did a few days ago. Renee replies, there is nothing Lord Devourer should be sorry for, it is Renee, who does not have the right to face him. He tells her that, Primordial Core needs a guardian named Renee. And me too, Renee, I need you. She asks, if he is not resentful of her. He says, I am not, as he stands up, and says, I have something for you, he pulls out beheading Fong saying, it is an item that you left behind. She holds the weapon in her arms and starts crying. As tears start dropping, she says, Renee was scared of being abandoned and hated by Lord Devourer. He tells her, I will never abandon you, or hate you, let us both go back home, back to the primordial core.